Now today we'll look at a short and easy sutta, very instructive sutta, which gives us a very important point in learning of Dhamma. And also knowing what is the true kind of Buddhism and what is not. The title of the sutta is Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta. Abhaya is the name of this person. Raja Kumara is a title. Here Raja, Raja usually means king, but here you can translate as royal. Kumara means normally means son. But here the son's king is called a prince. So we can translate Raja Kumara as royal prince or sim simply prince. Sutta, of course, means thread teaching to discourse to Prince Abaya. The, the problem with the translation is we select one meaning, one possible translation. Abaya Raja Kumara Sutta can be translated in a number of ways. You can simply translate it as the Abaya Raja Kumara discourse, right? That's a direct translation. You can say the discourse about Abaya Raja Kumara, about Prince Abaya. Or you, in this case, we say the discourse to Abaya, Prince Abaya. In other words, here we focus on the vocation that the Buddha gave this teaching to the prince, something actually is a more of a dialogue between these two people, okay? And then you see M58, this, remember this number? If you find the titles very long and you, you like this sutta, remember this number, okay? So M58, right? That is cost to Prince Abaya. And then if you wonder what is it about, and this helps you to remember also. So in this, so the, the essence of it, the theme, of the Buddha is not caught by trick questions. In a sense, there's a bit of a very interesting, a, a bit light humor. We see someone trying to trick the Buddha, but the Buddha knows this, he catches the trick right away. All right. So uh, who is Prince Abhaya? Right? So you can see all this in the introduction. I'll just kind of summarize for you. No need to read it, but you just know roughly where it is if you like. Prince Abhaya was the son of King Bimbisara. So this was probably quite early in the Buddha's life. And uh, now, you know, those days, as you know, these kings, they often have affairs with the most beautiful women in the country. And, and they have this really high class women, you know, you call them geishas in Japan. And uh, in India, ancient times, you have this, the most, she's, they would be called the most beautiful women in the city. And they are very high class, you know, so you, they, they can, they have to decide whether they want to spend their time with you or not. So she, this, so the royalty, the king often will like, you know, go to them, spend time with them. So this, this uh, woman is called Padumawati, courtesan of Ujjaini. Ujjaini is the capital city somewhere in the southwest of where the Buddha usually is in, in, in the northern India. So this is in the southwest, uh, towards the Bombay side, if you like. Uh, but it's north of the Vindhya Mountains. It's still, it's far away from Bombay still, but it's in that direction. It's called Awanti, all right? Some people say this is the home of Pali, you know? so we still not so, we are not so sure, but it's a, quite a famous place. The Vindhya Mountains are just uh, south of the, of the Ganges Plain. So Abaya, uh, he, he was originally a, a Jain follower, Nataputa, the, the Jains. Nataputa, also known as Mahavira, the founder of, of Jainism. And this is a story about how he was converted to Buddhism, a very interesting story. So also, you, you can also see this sutta as a study in conversion, how Buddhist conversion happens. It's very interesting, right? The Buddha actually does nothing. It is this intelligent man, 
he sees what's happening and he, he learns the truth and he changes by himself, all right? So the Vinaya tells a story about how this prince, Abaya, actually discovered this baby called Jivaka Kumarabacha, the baby Jivaka. See this, this Jivaka was again born from another courtesan called Salawati. And uh, these courtesans, as you know, they, they don't have babies. If they have babies, then it won't be good for business. No? So they, they would get rid of the baby. So she left a baby uh, in some rubbish, uh, rubbish heap. You know? And this prince, young prince comes along and he sees the baby. And she at once, you know, takes him and says, oh, he's alive. You know? So it's Jiwa, Jiwa. I mean, he's alive. You know? So he's very happy. And this Komara Bacha is uh, like a title. It means like raised by the prince. You know? So he, he, it's a title for this Jivaka. He became the Buddha's doctor later on, became a very famous doctor. In fact, he, he became like a legend for, uh, of traditional Indian medicine. He is a very famous surgeon and so on. So, I mean, he, it is recorded in the Vinaya. You know? He even performed operations. So this is another not much studied area traditional Indian medicine started with the Buddha. Right? So, and it later became Ayurveda and so on, but it's actually Buddhist medicine. So th there are other stories, for example, Anguttara, the Anguttara commentary tells us that Abhaya actually was Abhaya's own son. And so th there are these different versions. These are very old stories. So. Uh, these commentators also they listen to accounts, ancient accounts. So you have different versions, but not, uh, this uh, he raised this this prince Abaya raised Jivaka as his own son. Right? So here this is the Abaya we are going to deal with, and uh, let's there, there are a lot more things to to read. Uh, which I will kind of tell you what are the key points as we go along. Yeah? Let us start with the sutta, the translation, page 170, yes. Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta, the discourse to Prince Abhaya, M58. Thus have I heard, at one time the Blessed One was staying in the squirrel's feeding ground in the bamboo forest, bamboo grove or bamboo forest, near Rajaga. Then Prince Abhaya approached Niganta Nataputta. Okay, Niganta is uh, uh, the name for the Jains. It's actually a, like a title. Ganta means a knot. Ni means no. Okay, no knot. The knot is loosened up, broken. That means they are free from suffering. This is their way of saying it. And Nataputta is the name of this teacher. Mahavira is his title. He's got another name. So he's the Jain teacher, the Jain founder. The Jains are very, very strict in their moral practice. They are vegetarians. Uh, they, they try their best to keep the precepts. Some of them are so strict, they will cover their mouth with, like we all use this COVID mask, you know? So they always have this mask over their face so that they don't accidentally breathe in any insects and kill them. All these insects don't go into their mouth, right? so they cover their mouths and noses. And some of them are even so strict that they will have a very soft kind of uh, feather tied to the end of a stick, like a walking stick. So as they walk, they will gently sweep the floor in front of them so that they don't step on any insects. So that They will go that far to respect life. So you can imagine how strict they are, the Jains. In fact, they are so strict that in the end, they, they, there are very few businesses they can you know, take up. See? Definitely, they will not be butchers and so on. You know? So even you find that they, they're, not, they're not a very big community, but they're very serious practitioners. So when the Turks attack India, they wiped out all those rich temples and those rich and lazy monks. So they all were killed. Many, almost all of them were killed. The others ran away. 
to the far south, to the north. And uh, universities were all destroyed overnight and, and the Nalanda library burned for months. There's so many scrolls there and books. This, this nasty uh, Turks, they burn everything. So within a few years, Buddhism was completely wiped out from India. Well, almost wiped out, effectively wiped out. But the Jains survived. This is the amazing thing. They, they, they were non-violent people. They, they, you, you don't see them around. You don't like, like the monks. See, the, the monks are very conspicuous, isn't it? Because these Jains, they, they have this very remarkable tradition of lay teachers. So these lay teachers will teach in their own homes, teach the, their own, their so-called Dharma, Dharma means teaching. So they just went on like that, you see, without the temples. So you can see how they survive right? by, by studying Dharma at home in groups, right? So this is very important. That is why we stress on Dharma study. And they're very serious in their practice. Of course, there are other Jain practitioners living quietly, not in the cities, not in crowded areas. You see, the problem with the Buddhist monks, after a while, they become very successful. They build big temples in near big cities. Later in the big city, they become very prominent, very well known. So that also brings down their downfall. And you can see this in China, in, in Japan, Korea also, same fate everywhere. In fact, the whole of Asia, you know, you see this problem. So Buddhism disappeared because of our, it's our own fault in that sense. Okay? So these Jains, they practice on their own and they, they learn the Dharma at home. And today you see them doing very good, they're very good businessmen, especially in jewelry and printing. They are very good printers, so you'll see them printing many Buddhist books and so on. So this, these are the Jains, okay? So the, the, their history go back even before the Buddha's time. They're older than Buddhism. Now here you see this teacher uh, is depicted as trying to defeat the Buddha in, in, in debate or trying to... Uh, the Niganta is trying to show his follower, Prince Abhaya, that uh, the Buddha can be defeated. In other words, the Buddha's wrong view. So this is his idea. He was hoping that this intelligent young man would, would learn something there. So this is what he tells. He gives Prince Abhaya one of his leading followers in Rajagaha. Rajagaha. He gives him an assignment, right? So Having said so here, let's read the section two. Then Prince Abhaya approached Niganta Nataputta, having approached, he saluted Niganta Nataputta and sat down at one side. As Prince Abhaya was thus seated at one side, Niganta Nataputta said this to him, come my prince. Now this, I put in my here because in English, it, make, it sounds better to say my prince, but whereas in, uh, Pali, in Indian idiom, the word Kumara, prince, sounds quite well, quite good already. But if you translate as come, prince, it sounds very odd, okay? Very impersonal, even rude, okay? So calling people correctly is very helpful. It's called right speech, pleasant speech. Come, my prince, refute, refute the recluse Gautama's doctrine. Then a good report concerning you will be spread about us. Prince Abhaya has refuted the doctrine of the recluse Gotama, so mighty, so powerful. All right. But it is a very common uh, tradition, if you like, in, in the Buddhist time. It's an open society. Anyone can debate with anyone. And if you lose, usually you'll have the, the, the grace and goodwill to join the, the other teacher, <laughs> because your doctrine is, it doesn't work, you see, so they normally will do that. And a lot of this kind of intelligent people who are, who are teachers in their own right, they go around debating and then they, they lose debates with Sariputta, with the Buddha, then they become monks. Mm -hmm. So you see this amazing openness 
in, in India in those days. But today, religion has become something else. Right? In fact, uh, what's interesting is we can uh, now at, at the point of my study now, I realized that, you know, actually you can see Buddhism not, not as religions, not as a religion, as a philosophy you like, but philosophy is kind of a weak word, but the three trainings, okay, the moral training, uh, training in meditation, and then wisdom. Okay? So, but, but this is quite a mouthful, you know. So we use the word religion in, in a free, free way to, to kind of simplify this three trainings, right? So when we say Buddhism is a religion, remember, it's not like other kinds of religion. What is the meaning here? Other kinds of religion, they have a fixed code of belief. You, you have to believe this. Whether you understand or not, you believe it. You know, if there is a God, you believe it, or something like that. You know, you don't question it. And then there's a set of rituals. You practice it, right? You just practice it like that. It is it, 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 nothing to reflect on, nothing uh, to be wise about. You, you reflect on it because that's what makes you a member of the group. And that's a religion. Okay. Whereas in Buddhism, we, we don't really have that kind of thing. Although today you see Buddhism becoming a religion, right? In, in most temples, it has become a religion. So that's another story. So the teaching of the Buddha is such that you practice the five precepts, right? Not ritually, because the five precepts are meant to Purify your person, to, to refine your person. You don't kill, you don't steal, you don't commit adultery and so on. So this strengthens your goodness through your body. And then the fourth precept is about your speech. This, this sutta is about speech. You strengthen yourself through your speech. So it's not a religion. So this is a, a, a personal training, personal development. You, you have to do this yourself. The Buddha can't do this for you. You can't pray and say, may I be pure. You do it, you see. So that's not a religion, right? So in that sense, we don't call Buddhism, early Buddhism anyway, a religion. And same thing with meditation. You do meditation not to gain powers or, or meet some god or something, or, or, or get in touch with the Buddha and then, wow, get empowered and then start a new sector. That's religion. Here you meditate to be at peace with yourself. You meditate to calm your mind and you use that calmness, that clarity to understand the Buddha's teaching and you go on from there and then wisdom arises. Right? So people value wisdom and they respect teachers. So here this uh, Nataputta is using uh, this famous Indian tradition of debate. So he, he sends, he's very clever. He himself doesn't want to debate with the Buddha, you see, because if he loses, it'd be quite, uh, it'd be very devastating. So he sends his leading disciple, the leading follower, Prince Abhaya, he says, you go and defeat the Buddha and debate. Okay, now the prince asks, but how Bhante, Shall I refute the doctrine of the recluse Gotama, so mighty, so powerful? Come, my prince, says Nataputta. Approach the recluse Gotama, having approached the him, then ask him. Okay, before that, you notice that there is this uh, social grace. Approach him, salute him, right? So they always salute the teacher, even if it is a teacher from the opposing camp. You show that respect, that common respect is always there. In fact, you also see the Buddha early in the morning when he, he goes up for arms. If it's too early, he will drop in at the wondrous camp, wondrous uh, ashram nearby, and just chat with them. So you have this in, interreligious dialogue going on also in the Udumbarika Sihanada Sutta, for example. You see the Buddha talking with these people of other faiths not quarreling with them, but talking like scholars talk today, okay? Good scholars are there. Right, so uh, Prince Abaya instructs, uh, I mean, 
this Niganta Nataputta instructs Prince Abhaya. He says, you go to the Buddha, salute him, and then you ask him this question. Okay, 3.2. This is the this is the trick question. Okay, so pay close attention to this. I've unlined it for you. Bante, okay, so this is Abhaya asking the Buddha, supposed to, to do that when he meets the Buddha. Bante, would the Tathagata utter speech? that would be unpleasant and disagreeable to others okay in simple words do you do you say things which are not pleasant uh, to other people all right that's the question okay but it's a trick question so this is not finished yet so the nikanta says okay you ask him this question and then if he answers, okay, this is what you do, all right? So now the instructions follow. If the recluse Gotama, when questioned by you, does were to answer, the Tathagata, my prince, would utter speech that would be unpleasant and disagreeable to others. All right. So if the Buddha say yes, okay, yes, I, I do speak rough speech, I do speak unpleasant speech, this, I do say disagreeable, disagreeable words, then you reply. Then Pante, what is the difference between you and an ordinary person? For an ordinary person too would utter speech that would be unpleasant and disagreeable to others, right? So if the Buddha say yes, I do, you know, speak harsh words, unpleasant words, then you challenge the Buddha and say, in that case, you are no different from other unawakened people, they also talk like that. They have rough words, unpleasant speech, right? So this is the first horn, the first horn, the two horns of a dilemma. This is the first horn. I'll explain this meaning in a while, all right? Now, then comes the second part, right? It's not finished yet, 3.3. But, says Niganta, if the recluse Kotama, when questioned by you, does were to answer, the Tathagata, my prince, would not utter speech that would be unpleasant and disagreeable to others, then you should say to him, then Bhante, why have you declared of Devadatta thus? Devadatta is destined for the suffering state. That Devadatta is destined for hell. Devadatta will remain there for an eon, for a world cycle. Devadatta is incorrigible. He cannot be corrected. He, he won't have a chance to attain the path of his life. Devadatta was angry and displeased with the speech of yours. So here we see Neganta actually knowing a bit of the story of the Buddha no? and his cousin Devadatta. So, these are the two horns. This is the second horn. Eh? So if, if the Buddha says, uh, I do not, I won't utter any unpleasant words, then you challenge him and say, but then you you spoke of this, of Devadatta. So here, of course, the, the story here is that Devadatta was doing really nasty thing and then the Buddha was simply telling the truth here. Like what, what happened to him? The Buddha was not saying this out of hate, he's just saying what will happen, what will happen to Devadatta because of his own karma. So he's telling this as a, like a warning, like a, uh, the nature of karma, if you do something bad like this, you, look at Devadatta tried to kill the Buddha, you know, tried to poison the Buddha, tried to assassinate the Buddha by, by getting people to, to hurl a huge rock on the high spot in a mountain, in a hill, and so on. So this there's all bad karma and he, he has to face the consequences of this, right? So but here of course Nataputta is uh, misconstruing this story and say that the Buddha is talking bad about Devadatta without really examining why he's talking this way, right? So someone may say some words which sound harsh but actually it's the truth so you you cannot you know speak of the truth in a weak way then it will not be 
so emphatic and people will notice it. Anyway, in this case, the Buddha is simply telling the truth. Right, so then in the next section, this uh, Nataputta explains to uh, this Abhaya and also to us that it is a, what is it, what is it, that, what trick is this, okay? Or, or what uh, method of debate is this? 3.4. My prince, when the recluse Gotama is given this double horn question by you, he will neither be able to throw it up nor swallow it. So this is also in the meaning of double horn. You can uh, give it up and you can also own it. Either way, you get into trouble. Just as if an iron hook were stuck in a man's throat, he would not be able to either throw it up or swallow it down. Okay. So this is the metaphor. Explain what is called a double horn dilemma. Okay, so it's a, it's a dilemma. Okay, let's go further down now. Section, right? So, so too, my prince, when the Rekus Gotama is given this double horn question by you, he will neither be able to throw it up nor swallow it down. All right, so Prince Abaya says, yes, Bante. So, okay, he obeys the teacher, okay? Then he rose from his seat and after saluting Niganta Nataputa, keeping him, the Nigranta, to his right side, departed and approached the Blessed One. Having approached, he saluted him and then set him at one side. So you see here, the scene changes, right? So from uh, sitting before his teacher, Nataputa, now he moves to see the Buddha. Right? So it's, it's a, he has to travel a bit, yeah? So, now, let's just a couple of, uh, just one point before we go on. Eh? Uh, this double horn means, double horn question is this uh, dilemma. It's a trick question, uh, which is often used in religion. And if you answer either way, you are caught. You will be wrong. This is what uh, usually used by evangelists, yeah? Use uh, it's a trick question. Uh, you, you find the uh, the Christian evangelists that like to do this. Uh, in fact, I was once approached by this kind of people, and then they asked me, "What do you think of Christ?" Okay, what do you think of Christ? So they know you. You can only answer in two ways. One is, uh, "Okay, I don't know about him. Please tell me." Then he will preach to you. On the other hand, you may say, oh, I don't like him. You know, I, don't want to, I, I don't agree with him and so on. And then also he will ask you why. So either way, he will engage you in a religious talk. So they are trained to do this. And I remember those days when I was a young monk, I used to hold training camps for the students because the students can complain to me, say, oh, you know, in, in campus, all these religious these evangelists are troubling them, approaching them, debating with them, and, and sometimes they wonder uh, who's right, who's wrong, and they're also not sure what to do. Right? So, the, <laughs> this sutta answers that, you know, later on, you know, you find out uh, what to do. Right? Basically, I can tell you here is that don't get caught with this. First of all, you've got to recognize this is a trick question, it's a double horn question. Either way, you get caught, you get pulled into a, a discussion which you will lose because this is what they want, this is what they want you to talk, and then in the end, they know what answers you will give, and then you go back very angry, very unhappy, and then in the end, you say, oh, why not I join them? You know, they're better than me, right? So this is the, this is the way they, they work. <laughs> this is the idea of conversion. The simple way is not to say anything. All right, not to say anything, silence, silence, okay? That's the reply. So in fact, that's what happened once. I was sitting in the bus and then this Mormon, you know, came up to me and <laughs> they, they, they're very nice dress, so they wear, and they look very neat and then they, they have a little name tag and they'll come to you and they say, oh, oh here he comes, you know? So he says, uh, okay, what do you think of Christ? Or they, they will engage ask you something about religion. So I said, uh, I told him directly, you know, 
Okay, in Singapore, we're very impressed when, when a white man comes to talk to us, you know, so we're very happy. <laughs> we feel we are special and then we want to hear. But, but I told him, I said, no, nope, sorry, I, I'm not talking to you <laughs> because I, I'm, I'm just happy. I said, I'm not talking to you. I, I don't say anything more. That's all I said, I'm not talking to you. I don't even say I'm not talking to you because you're a Mormon or, or because I'm a Buddhist. I just say I'm not going to talk to you and, and I have every right, we have every right not to say anything. And he says, uh, why can't we discuss religion? I said, no, I'm, I'm quite happy. I, I don't want to say anything, right? So because I don't want to answer his question, see, then you get caught. The moment you answer, you get caught. I said, no. Nope. So I keep saying the same thing. I said, no, nope, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not in a talking mode. And after a third time, we got very annoyed. He said, you're not normal. I said, okay, but I'm still not in a talking mood. I said, <laughs> and then he had to go away. They said, oh, it's hard to, you know. So that's how you deal with him. You're happy. He's not happy, you're too bad with, with him. You know? I mean, I didn't cause the happiness. He himself tried to, you know, impose himself on me. So I said, no, nope, I'm not going to talk with you. This is the fourth way of answering a question. This is practicing the Dharma. You're practicing Buddhism. You're not, you know, pushing him away. You're not doing anything intellectual. You are practicing the Dharma. Because uh, here is where I'm going to tell you a bit about these four ways of answering questions. Uh, this is found in a number of suttas. For example, the Panha Vyakarana Sutta A442. This is found all found in your introduction notes. Don't look at them now. Okay, later you can look at it. It is in section four point three point one. The Panha Via Karana Sutta, the discourse on answering questions. The, if someone asks you a question, you can answer directly. First, first way of answering is directly. Okay. Second way of answering is uh, directly means yes or no. Okay. And second way of answering is a more detailed analytic answer, which gives an explanation. Okay, a bit more detailed. The third way of answering is called counter question. We ask a question in return because the question is not clear or we're not sure of the intention why the question is asked, All right? And then the last one is called, the question is to be rejected as wrongly put. You don't want to say anything about it because it's not going to be useful, All right? So let's just briefly look into a bit of detail here, All right? Right, so the first way of answering a question, direct answer, is for example, someone asks us, uh, does the Buddha teach karma? We say yes or no. I mean, it's nothing, uh, there's no other way of answering is either yes or no, right? That's a proper way. Have you taken your food? Yes or no, right? So very easy. Now, then, Second kind of question is uh, someone may ask you, uh, what did the Buddha say about karma? Okay, what is the Buddhist teaching of karma? Right, you cannot say yes or no here, but you've got to go into some details. So this is a second way of answering. So you've got to look at the question first, right? Now the third one is you got, you're not sure why this person asked a question, ask you. For example, the person comes to you and, and say, ask you the same question, you know. Uh, does the Buddha teach karma, right? But here, you, you know a bit of background, this person, you know he knows a bit about karma already. So you're wondering, why does he still want to ask the question? So you ask him, uh, why do you ask about karma? Because you already you know, you have your own ideas about it, right? Then this person will tell you, oh, you know, uh, in my opinion, karma is like this, like this, like this. So I want to know, uh, is this true or not? Then it becomes clearer. You, you know his intention. You know what his, where his doubt is. So you zero down more closely, more exactly to the problem, in other words. So in this way, you talk more effectively, more clearly. That's the meaning here. So that's the counter question. 
is not to trick anyone. It, it is to clarify the situation. It's also to, to know the intention and, and to put your our discussion on the right track, right? So that, that's the whole thing. It's because in, in early Buddhism, where the Buddha is concerned, uh, discussions are very serious. They, 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 they should be discussion. The discussions, the people who are discussing should respect each other, respect learning. So th these are ways to show their respect. And number four, sometimes they ask questions which are not relevant, trick questions, then, sorry, we can answer that. Right? Shall we put this aside? Because sometimes uh, we don't, we cannot agree in, in something that's not going to help. Either way, it's not going to help. So let's, what the Buddha said, let's put this aside. We don't need to discuss this, not at this time. Anyway, we will not get anywhere because we both have strong opinions and our teachings don't agree. So that's fine. We set it aside, right? And in fact, this is what the Buddha said at, at the end of the Udumbarika Sihanada Sutta, the principles of inter faith dialogue. Right? So these are the four ways of answering questions, right? Which is connected to with the silence. Yeah? Okay, so it's just nice. Now it's nine o'clock by this clock. We're going to take a short break and we continue next with the Abaya's interview with the Buddha himself. All right, this comes the main part, the interesting part. Let's take a break now. Okay, we'll take a five minutes break now. Okay, so now Prince Abaya visits the Buddha. Okay, so this is a new chapter, 4.2. Right, 4.2. Sit down at one side. Prince Abaya looked at the sun. Okay, so this is a very interesting detail. He looked at the sun and thought, it's too late today to refute the Blessed One's doctrine. I shall refute the Blessed One's doctrine in my own house tomorrow. Now, I'm not sure of the details here. Uh, what does it mean here, late? One possible guess is it's past noon and the monks, you know, after the noon meal, monks are very weak. <laughs> they, they normally won't talk much. They'll be tired, they'll be resting. And the, the Buddha and the monks will rest in the quiet place because it's going to be warm. So they'll be meditating in the nearby forest, maybe. So Abaya is very considerate. He, he thought, okay, let me uh, talk to the Buddha tomorrow. I will invite him to my own house for dana, right? Then he said to the Blessed One, Bhante, let the Blessed One and three others consent to accept tomorrow's meal from me. The Blessed One consented by his silence. Right. So here we have lots of social conventions. So here, Prince Abaya invites the Buddha and he says he only invites four people, right? The Buddha plus three monks. So the question is why do you invite only four monks? Because one more person, just think one more person, it'll be the Sangha. He could have done that. <clears throat> and it'd be wonderful. But uh, he's not a Buddhist yet, if you remember. He's not a follower of the Buddha. So he was simply following instructions of his teacher, Mahavira, and he's going to debate with the Buddha. Now he's a prince. He's, he's probably a rich man. He's able to give food to even five monks, but he, he didn't because his idea was to defeat the Buddha, not really to offer arms, right? So, but in, in doing so, he was actually embarking on something good. This is an interesting point. He doesn't even know it at this point yet. So he invites the Buddha and three others. And the Buddha accepted the invitation by silence. So here again, you see the silence at work, right? In fact, I've written one article on the Buddha silence. There are many meanings and usages of silence in early Buddhism. Right? So there's a whole essay on silence. Five, then knowing that the Blessed One had, had consented, Prince Abaya rose from his seat and having saluted the Blessed One, giving him the Blessed One to his right side, departed. So here again, you see this Prince Abaya is very respectful. <clears throat> he treats the Buddha just as he treats Mahavira. So here, right side, to the sacred person, right side to the sacred object. This is the 
the basic principle behind uh, procession circumambulation. Okay. Another way of putting it right side here is going sunwise. This is the way the sun orbits, right? So when we go around, say a stupa, we also go sunwise, clockwise. Of course, we wouldn't say clockwise, it would be anachronistic because with us time there were no clocks, right? So we say sunwise or the sutta say rightwise, the right side towards the sacred object, sacred person. Now then we have a new, another day now, okay? So you see here in, in, in the Pali suttas, you have to have some literary sense, literature sense. Huh? So you have different space, right? Prince Abaya talks to Mahavira and then goes to see the Buddha. Now we have different day. One day passes. All right, then look at five, section five. Then when the night had ended, oh wait, before that, so the first two lines, then knowing that the Blessed One had consented, Prince Abaya rose from his seat and having saluted the Blessed One, keeping to the right side, he departed. Then when the night had ended, early in the morning, right? So this early means around four o'clock, you know, four something. The Blessed One dressed and taking rope and bow went to Prince Abaya's house and sat down at the prepared seat. So all these are done early in the morning before sunrise. So by the time you reach the house, it'll be around five o'clock, I suppose. Then with his own hands, Prince Abaya served and satisfied the Blessed One with various excellent food, both hot and soft. Right? So he gave Savdana into the Buddha's bowl and the three other monks. So then, so that's the morning dana. So it's, that's the only meal the Buddha would take, right? Now, now comes the interview, comes the actual teaching, right? The Buddha answers. Let's push up the slide a bit. Yeah, very good. When the Blessed One had finished his meal and washed his bowl and hands, Prince Abaya, taking a low seat, sat down at one side. Now here again, you see this uh, common habit of the Buddha and you see this habit with the forest monks today. They finish eating and then they will clean their bowl and then they, they wash it, a simple wash, you know, rinse them would be probably a better term. And then they'll cover the bowl. That means they finish eating. Right? Of course, when, when they finish, when they already stop eating, they, they will, you know, like if anyone wants to serve more food, they'll just put their hand over the bowl. Uh, so this is the very interesting monastic practice. So now this is the moment Prince Abaya is waiting for. Sitting thus at one side, Prince Abaya said this to the Blessed One. Ha, ah, here comes the question in section six. Pante, would the Tathagata utter speech that would be unpleasant and disagreeable to others? All right, here, here comes the Buddha's answer, which we did not expect at all in the introduction. The Buddha replies and says, my prince, is this not, is not this bias? Right? Isn't this a one-sided question? Isn't this a trick question? Right? So it was the Buddha says this, right? So the Buddha is very wise. He, he just like at once he points out and says, this is a trick question, right? Now Abaya also is very intelligent, right? So at once he knew, he knows the Buddha knows, you see. Then Bante, the Nigrantas have lost in this, right? So you see a bit of humor here, right? So this, I like to see it in that way, rather than anger, hatred, you know. So here you see this Prince Abaya maybe smiling and say, wow, you know, this Buddha is amazing. Huh? He, he, knows, he knows what's going on here. Then Bhante, the Grantas have lost in this, right? Now the Buddha is quite curious, you know. Right, notice here again, we don't have the Mahayana storytelling saying, oh, the Buddha knows everything. Then you don't have to study the Sutta. The Buddha doesn't have to say anything. You know? So the Buddha asks this prince, why do you say this, my prince? Then Bhante and then the Grantas have lost in this, right? right? Yeah. Well, okay, you, you can ask this interesting question. Is the Buddha, does the Buddha know or does not he, he know what is in the mind of the, the prince? But the point is, the simple answer is, the Buddha does not know. 
at this point. It's not that the Buddha is ignorant. He does not know because he did not scan the prince's mind at that time. Okay, he did not uh, kind of take the trouble to say, let's see what this prince is thinking, you see. I mean, that was spoiled the thing. I mean, we have no story, we have no sutta if that was the case. The Buddha could do that, and there are occasions when the Buddha did that. But in a sense, you can say the Buddha already knew this earlier on. The Buddha already read the question, okay? And then the Buddha replied. So this is where you see a, a very human Buddha in early Buddhism, a very approachable Buddha, someone who teaches us the Dharma so that we can understand it. Why do you say this, my prince? Right? Why do you say then man, man, the Negrantas have lost this? All right, then in the next part, you, you see this prince relating everything, the whole story, the whole passage is repeated. Yeah? Now, my first translation of this was done in 2005, right? At that time, I still uh, still did not follow. I'm still not sure of the many things. So I tried to shorten this part, you know. I just said then the Buddha, uh, then, then Prince Abaya repeated, related the story of his instructions, his meeting with Mahavira and so on. Then Grandman, a very wonderful friend here, he uh, suggested that we should put down the passage in full. So here you have the full passage, right? Prince Abaya recounts his meeting with Nata Buddha. So when you read, you chant, you can read the whole thing. But I won't go, I won't read to you all these things because you know the story, right? So I will just kind of summarize that. Nataputta instructs Prince Abhaya to meet the Buddha and ask the Buddha the trick question, right? So he's relating to the Buddha so that the Buddha knows the background and we also know the background. Also, this, this passage repeats the whole of the introduction right down to 6.4, all right? Now, let's go to number seven, okay? So this, this is what happens next. Some, there are a few interesting points, you know, a few interesting events, developments here. Now at that time, now at that time, a young tender infant was lying on his back on Prince Abaya's lap. Now, you may just read this line and then think, not think much about it. But if you stop for a while and think, who is this tender young infant, right? It is possible that this could be the young Jiwaka. We're not told, see, all right? So anyway, that's not the part of the story because if, if we have too many details, then we get distracted. Here, the idea of the sutta is to teach us about asking questions and asking the right questions and answering in the right way. So the sutta just said, the narrator simply tells us there was this young, tender infant lying on his back on Prince Bayas' lap. Then the Blessed One said this to Prince Abaya. Right. So here the Buddha uses something which is common to both the Buddha and Prince Abaya and something that Prince Abaya can relate to. What do you think, my Prince? If, you, if while you were not mindful of him or your nurse were not mindful of him, the child were to put a stick or a pebble into his mouth, what would you do to him? All right. So here is where the Buddha uses a very uh, a, a, a metaphor or an, an idea very close at heart. So this is how the Buddha teaches and in a sense bring Dharma to others. So it's very good to study this. And then we also practice this kind of approach. Okay. So Prince Abaya replies, Bhante, I would remove it. Bhante, if I could not remove it at once, I would hold his head in my left hand and crooking a finger, bending a finger of my right hand, I would take it out, even if it meant drawing blood. I mean, even if it hurt him a bit, I would remove that stick or that stone. Why is that? Because I have compassion for the child, right? So I mean, he loves this child, so of course he wants to make sure that this child doesn't suffocate. Right, so this is the a human story. This is a story of this world. So the Buddha uses a story of this world, something 
familiar in this world, and then the Buddha brings us, brings Prince Abhaya to a higher level of the Dharma. Worldly level, Dharma level, the two levels of languages. Now comes the teaching, right? The Buddha, notice how the Buddha gradually prepares Prince Abhaya for the teaching. And here, second aid is the teaching itself. There are six points of the teaching, right? Even so, my prince, like the moment you see, even so, the Buddha introducing his teaching. Even so, my prince, such speech as the Tathagata knows to be untrue, false, and not connected with the goal, and that is unpleasant and disagreeable to others, the Tathagata does not utter such a speech. He does not utter such a speech. Notice. Look at, look at the configuration again. Something untrue, false, not connected with the goal. All right. Here, not in other words, it doesn't help us to practice moral with morality, mental concentration, or wisdom. It does not bring us closer to the path. Not useful in that sense, right? But it's something not very pleasant. And, and uh, it's rough speech, basically, not, not agreeable to others. The Buddha would not teach like that, would not teach this. Because notice the first part says untrue. This untrue and useless and unpleasant. It's all very negative. Apparently, the Buddha would not use this kind of talk. Number two, such speech as the Tathagata knows to be true, real, but not connected with the goal not connected with Dhamma, not connected with our practice. And that is unpleasant and disagreeable, disagreeable to others. The Tathagata does not utter such speech. He also, the Buddha, would not talk something which may be true, may be real, but not related to Dhamma, to practice. And moreover, it is unpleasant and disagreeable. Definitely the Buddha will not talk of this, right? And then, Number three, such speech as the Tathagata knows to be true, real. See, I've highlighted this. So you can know this is important. And connected with the goal, but that is unpleasant and disagreeable to others. Something true, real, connected with the Dharma, but not very pleasant, not very easy to hear. The Tathagata knows the time to use such speech. Right, so there, there's a right time. For example, uh, when uh, one of those monks have wrong views, you see, the Buddha has to tell him off that it's a wrong view, right? So at the right time, the Buddha would say that. In the Alagadupama Sutta and the Mahatthaha Sangaya Sutta, for example. Number four, such speech as the Tathagata knows to be untrue, false, and not connected with the goal but that is pleasant and agreeable to others. It's very nice to talk, but not true. Something not useful. The Tathagata does not utter such speech. Right? This is like gossip, you know, that, that the Buddha will not talk this way. No? Now, notice this one. This one is interesting, number four. No? Untrue, not connected with the goal, right? But this is what we normally would uh, talk when we gossip with friends, right? So definitely we, we wouldn't talk. But sometimes you find this kind of talking also found in the, the so-called, the, the, the Mahayana Skifu means, right? Like in Lotus Sutra and so on. So from this sutta, you know, that kind of talk is not right, not Dharma based, and we should avoid that, okay? Let me repeat, we should avoid that kind of speech. It is wrong, right? The Lotus Sutra is wrong in that sense. Number five, such speech as the Tathagata knows to be true, real, but not connected with the goal, but it is pleasant and agreeable to others. Right? So here again, it's very nice, but not true, not connected with the Dharma. Again, the Buddha would not talk. Right? This is also some like a bit of gossip, né? gossip we talk. For example, if we talk about sports, a TV show, right? The Buddha will not talk of those things. We will not talk of those things. Okay. 
follow the Buddha's teaching. Then number six, such speech as the Tathagata knows to be true, real, and connected with the goal. Okay, here, true, real, and useful. And it is pleasant and agreeable to others. Wow, it is all good, right? The Tathagata knows the time to use such speech. So this is the Buddha would, you know, teach us. Right? For example, in this sutta, you, you find all this true, real, and useful, and the language agreeable. At the right time, the Buddha would use this kind of language. Why is that? Because, my prince, the Tathagata is compassionate to beings. Right? So the Buddha is echoing the prince. He said, well, the Buddha also is compassionate. So here, the Buddha tries to show whatever the prince is, the Buddha also thinks in the same way. So you can see this beautiful connection, right? So you imagine if Prince Abba is listening and say, wow, this teacher is wonderful, this Buddha is wonderful. He's connecting with what I've just said. He is affirming what I've just said, right? In a good way, in a positive way, right? Now let's look at these six points again. And they have been summarized in the introduction. And I I think if Wendy can just go up a bit to section 3.2, Wendy. 3.2, yeah. Up the introduction. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Okay, coming to the end. Yes. Ah, here you are. Okay, this the one. So these are these pairs of opposing qualities can be expanded into a comprehensive set of eight possible propositions, of which six apply to the sutta. So in other words, the, the six points here are listed there, but there are still two extra were not mentioned in the sutta. No? <clears throat> so you notice on the far left, number one, see two, useful, pleasant, all right? So this found section 8.6. So if something is too useful, pleasant, the Buddha would assert it in the, at the proper time, at the right time, okay? Then number two is true, it is useful, but unpleasant. Here also the Buddha would speak in this way. Right? So here these are the two kinds of approaches the Buddha would use. In other words, this is the only two mentioned in the Sutta. The Buddha will only speak something which is true and useful, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant. That's that as far as the Buddha would go. So this is called true based on truth, truth-based speech. Now notice all the other six. True, useless, but pleasant. The Buddha would not assert such a statement. The Buddha would not talk in this way. Number four, something true, useless, unpleasant. No, definitely the Buddha would not use this kind of speech. All right. Then number five, it is false, useful, pleasant. Now, what kind of speech you might think? And this is a sales talk in real life, all right? So, I mean, something is not true. Let's say you want to buy some fruits and the fruit seller says, oh, very nice, oh, this is very nice. You know, why, why don't you buy this? Right? It's very pleasant, smiling at you. And then you buy this fruit home and you find it's very bitter, <laughs> very sour, right? So, again, the Buddha will not talk like that, all right? Okay, so basically, we should avoid this. But notice, this is not mentioned in the... Sutta, right? Now, I don't know offhand why it's not mentioned. Of course, you, you can probably say, oh, you know, this is very common speech amongst the, the traders and, and, and hawkers and so on, and, and, and people who sell things, right? So probably the Buddha just doesn't want to make them feel uneasy, so he keeps quiet about it. It doesn't mean it is right, see? but it is based on false speech, okay? Then number six, it is false, Useful, but unpleasant. Okay, and here, of course, the Buddha definitely would not talk this way. Number seven, something which is false, useless, but pleasant. Okay, this is some, some kind of uh, uh, gossip, gossip, gossipy talk, talking bad about someone, right? And it's also not true, but it, you like to hear it because it's very gossipy. Okay, uh, then he would not assert. We not talk about this thing, and then number eight, the last one, false, useless, unpleasant. It's all negative. Definitely, the Buddha would not talk in this way. 
Okay, now before to save you all from asking me questions because you feel so uncertain, these are ideal way of talking. I mean, if you really want to be a good teacher, you, you want to make people feel comfortable with you, that your word is trustworthy, this is the way to talk. But yes, it is true, I would say it's not easy in, in ordinary life, especially if you are selling things, you meet people, you find you can always talk like this. So you try your best, right? Whatever it is at that time when you're talking, you should not talk to hurt people. But sometimes even in doing so, people still get hurt. Then after the fact, later on in your quiet moments, after your meditation, you reflect, where did I go wrong? Okay, That's when you apply the Dharma. So just because you see all these teachings in front of you, you, you should not at once say, oh, you know, I must be like this. It's not so easy to be like this at once. So this is an ideal. So we build up bit by bit as the conditions are right, as our lives improve, then our speech also improves. So that is the way we work bit by bit, we say, step by step, gradually, we improve ourselves. Okay. All right. Now, having said that, let's finish up the sutra. Now, let's go back to the parable of the chariot. This is the last part, section nine. Right. Okay. Pass. Okay. There you are, parable of the chariot. So the Buddha now highlight comes to the highlight of the sutta. He uses a parable. Uh, Bhante, when learned, oh wait, before this is where Abhaya asked the Buddha another interesting question. Bhante, when learned kshatriyas, learned brahmins, learned householders, learned recluses, after preparing a question, then go to the Blessed One and ask it, Bhante, is there already in the Blessed One's mind a thought? If they come to me and ask me thus, I shall answer thus. Does that answer occur to the Tathagata spontaneously? Now he's very curious, you know, he's very impressed with the Buddha, so he asked the Buddha, you know, people ask you a lot of questions. So do you have to think about the answer? Or do you answer just like that, naturally, spontaneously? So he's very curious, you see? It's a very interesting question. The Buddha's reply, section 10. In this connection, my prince, I will ask you a question in return. Ah, here you are. Counter question. Counter question, right? So that's why I mentioned it, the four kinds of we are answering questions. He doesn't answer directly. The Buddha could have answered directly, but here he asks Abhaya a question. Why? Again, he is, in a sense, the Buddha is converting Abhaya. See, this is the subtext, if you like. What's underneath the sutta, we don't notice, right? If you're sharp, you will notice, okay? He is speaking the language of Abhaya. He is saying things which will connect Abhaya to the Dharma. So, so he says, I will ask you a question in return. Answer it as you please. What do you think, my prince? What do you think? You see? So here the Buddha does not give the answer because the answer is already there in the prince. So he's asking the prince, are you, a, are you skilled in the parts of a chariot? This is where the Buddha knows that the prince knows about chariot. It's like asking a young man about cars. <laughs> and, and this young man, he repairs his own car. He, he likes all this mechanical stuff. So you ask him, he, of course, his eyes will light up and say, wow, you know. So of course, you know. So chariots is the, the ancient car, right? In modern times, it'd be a car. Yes, Bhante, I am. So imagine how Abaya would reply. He would say, yes, Bhante, I am. He's, he's going to be very excited. What do you think, my prince? When people come to you and ask, what is the name of this part of the chariot? Right? Is there already in your mind a thought, if they come to me to ask me, I shall answer thus, or the answer comes to you spontaneously, right? So here you are. The Buddha throws back the question to Abaya. And Abaya says, next uh, section, it says, Bante, I am well known as a charioteer. So he, he probably says with pride, you know, says, oh, come on, I know about cars, you know. So he says, I'm well known as a charioteer, skilled in the parts of a chariot. All the parts of a chariot are well known to me. 
that answer will come to me spontaneously. All right, so here you see, he already has the answer. The, the answer comes to him spontaneously. So the Buddha is going to use this fact. He says, look, you know this yourself. You know the answer comes to you spontaneously. Now the Buddha answers with something which Abaya is very familiar. Through his own experience, when we talk about empirical, your own experience, the Dharma is experienced that way. This is a very good example. Okay, so make a note, right? mental note. 11, even so, there the famous even so, right? So here this, the Buddha connects Abaya mind to the Dharma. Even so, my prince, when learned Kshatriyas, Kshatriyas are the noblemen, learned Brahmins, the priests, learned householders and learned recluses, after preparing a question, then approach the Tathagata, that's the Buddha, and ask it. The answer occurs to the Tathagata spontaneously, right? So there you are. See, notice the Buddha's answer is already familiar is already in the mind of uh, Abaya. So the, this is where the Buddha is directly telling Abaya, look, you already know the Dharma, you know, all right? But the Buddha goes a little deeper. Why is that? Now the Buddha explains something new, something different. This is what will change Abaya. Why is that? That is what Abaya does not know. The Dharma element or the true nature of things, okay, Dhamma Datu, has been fully penetrated by the Tathagata. Through such a full penetration, the answer occurs to the Tathagata spontaneously, right? Another way of putting it is we all go through life, we all suffer. So we know the answer in that way, all right? Take, take a simple example, okay? Recently, I posted with Ratna's permission, I posted online, said, oh, you know, Ratna has been diagnosed with first stage cancer and, uh, and so on and so forth, okay? Why am I doing this? We are putting out this sign, not to frighten people. Rather, we wrote in such a way is to tell you, okay, we do get sick too, you know? Don't think that we are like superhuman, you know? We don't get sick all the time teaching suttas, right? We, we do we do age, we do get sick, we do go hungry, we just like you. So we posted that post because we want you to feel that it is normal to fall sick. But don't fear it. Be calm, practice the Dharma. You know others also have suffered that way. Then you learn from it. So we posted that piece of sad news so that you too will be comforted, you too will be informed and you'll be wise and strong should anything happens to you in other ways. Okay? So that's the idea, not to frighten you, not to uh, you know, give you wrong ideas, right? So that is one way of putting it. When you understand the Dharma, you try to help others feel good about it too, right? At this point also, let me, you know, this, your compassion comes to my mind. So I have to thank a lot of those people who send us kind wishes and also who has given us lots of support and donations at the right time. And you know, in Singapore, it's very expensive to do, go for treatment without a government support subsidy. It's very difficult. So we are really thankful to you also at this point, right? So this connected with the Dharma element, right? Okay, so now we have come to the end of the Sutta. Prince Abayas is convinced the Buddha is right. He is very happy. He has become the Buddha's follower. Session 12. When this was said, Prince Abayas said this to the Blessed One. Excellent Master Gautama. Excellent Master Gautama. Just as if one were to place upright what had been overturned, over to reveal what was hidden, over to show the way to one who was lost. Or were to hold up a lamb in the dark so that those with eyes could see forms. In the same way, in numerous ways, has the Dharma been made clear by the Blessed Gautama. I, Bhante, go to the Blessed One for refuge, to the Dharma, to the community of monks, 
May the blessed one remember me as a lay follower who has gone forth from this day forth, uh, who, who has gone for refuge from this day forth for life. So Abhaya becomes a follower of the Buddha. He comes to debate with the Buddha, comes to debunk the Buddha, but instead he is impressed. Right? And it is not the first person, you know, that Mahavira sent, Mahavira sent General Siha and so on. In fact, all the, his top followers he sent to the Buddha, they got converted. And he was very angry, very upset. In the end, he got so angry, he coughed blood and died, so according to the story here. So here you are, we have, the, at the end of the story, Abhaya becomes a follower of the Buddha, Sadhu. So we stop here for your questions. Thank you, Pranapriya. Uh, we now have the Q&A session. I pass to Sister Icy. Thank you, Sister Wendy. Thank you, Brother Pia, for the super study. Let me read out the first question from uh, Sister Ho Yimei. Yep. Brother Pia, I'm curious about Niganta Nataputa. Yeah. Practices strict karma practices. Mm -hmm. Why would he even lead Prince Abaya to try to defame the Buddha? Bracket Niganta to know that karma acts as a bondage or bandha, which hinders yeah. enlightenment. This mm -hmm. clearly shows the Mahavihara title is Mahavira mm -hmm. title is questionable. <laughs> I, I don't know who gave his name Mahavira. It could be someone, someone, some of his disciple gave him the name. But Mahavira is quite a common name. Even the Buddhists also used the word. Uh, well, teachers are teachers. You know, uh, religious teachers, they often debate with one another in the Buddha's time. You find, for example, the Buddha often would uh, discuss ideas of the six other teachers, well-known teachers in India. So you, you find very often they will send their disciples to debate with the Buddha, although the Buddha, I don't remember the Buddha doing that, ever sending monks to debate with others. Although if they specifically spoke against the Buddha, then of course the Buddha would go and talk to them and try to explain things. It's normal that teachers would, uh, you know, discuss the teachings of other teachers and even try to refute them. So. I don't see anything wrong with that with Mahavira. Uh, of course, his idea is that maybe he feels that he, he wants to deepen the faith of Abaya, but it backfired actually. So that is a bit of miscalculation there. All right. And also we must we must remember, we have to be honest, these are stories told by the Buddhists themselves, you know. So the, the suttas are compiled by the Buddhists. So they, they put together this story to teach us the nature of debate, right? So, so that we, we know how to debate. And, and here, of course, naturally, the, the Buddha would be, you know, debating with someone else and and the, the Buddha would win. And this is to show us how to use the Dharma in terms of debate, uh, the wrong way, the right way, right? So we should take it as literature in that way. We don't really know the exact true story, what happened to each of these people. So I, I wouldn't claim to know historically exactly what happened, but we take the sutta as it is, uh, as literature, if you like, and it teaches us some valuable things. And, and if you do that, it, it is safe enough. You know, we, we don't become fanatics and say, oh, you know, the Buddha's like this, the Mahavira's like that. Uh, these are literary, literary characters, if you like, you take it like that. And from there, you learn what you can to better your life, okay? All right, next question. All right, thank you, Brother Pia. Next question from Brother LCO. Okay. From this sutta, the teaching reflected the seriousness of Buddha teaching as no nonsense and talk only the usefulness of the speech mm -hmm. for the advancement in Dhamma only. But in our normal human to human social relationship, mm -hmm. such approach may seem to recluse ourselves to be non social. Mm. Are we as lay Buddhists also need to be trying to be serious and how to be harmonious? Mm. We okay. live among all re religions and all walk of life and yeah. are we 
as lay Buddhists also need to only select our social friends mm -hmm. to be only all Buddhists only so that mm -hmm. we speak only the right subject and no right. others. Mm -hmm. Okay, you remember I already answered this question earlier. I stopped a while, I took some minutes off to explain. I said, somebody is sure to ask this question. I'm referring to this moment, okay? I'm, I'm referring to Brother LCU. I know he's, he's going to ask this question. Uh, so here you are, this is the question, all right? So please look back at my video and the answer is there. <laughs> so, okay, let me be, not be so nasty, okay? Uh, I already told you earlier, I said this is an ideal situation, you see, right? When you're among Buddhists, you're on your own. When you, you stand there before a crowd, people listen, listen to you, people look up to you. Naturally, you would try to present them your best, your, your best, you see? Especially as a Dharma teacher. Now, if you're not a Dharma teacher, you're a businessman, I, I can't say much. That's up to you what you want to do, you see? Now, we're not going to tell the world, oh, okay, this is what you must talk. You know, I mean, you've got how many millions of billions of people in the world, they're going to do the things they do. And we let them grow at their own pace. And they're like little children, they're, they're playing and shouting and talking all kinds of funny things. We don't go up to them and say, hey, you know, you should not play this. You know, these are not real, you know. I mean, they're, they're children, you know. So we let them play and then slowly as they mature, we guide them along. We, we talk to them in a way which is given in this sutta. And to be quite honest with you, I, I don't always talk with the, the two ways which the Buddha mentioned. I, I do talk in a fairy tale way, especially when I'm with children who are really good listeners. You know, I love talking to them because I can talk in any way I want in a fairy tale way and tell them fairy tales, you know, and, and they'll listen with big goo goo eyes and, and you know they're interested. And then slowly from there, you teach them something. So it depends on the audience, depends on the occasion, all right? So make the adjustment and then slowly you find uh, you become a better person and your audience respect you more and they also come closer to the Dharma. So make the proper adjustments as you need. Remember the Buddha says at the right time, on the right occasion. And that part is very important, right? Remember these are ideas, ideas means you look up to them, they're in your mind, they, they guide you. Okay? They're not the daily practical reality out there. If that is already the case, the Buddha would, won't need to teach, you see. The world is different and here's the Buddha's teaching and there is a gap, we try to close the gap. That is why the Buddha teaches, okay? All right, I hope that is satisfactory. Okay, let's go on. Thank you, Padre The next question from Sister Patricia. All right. Yeah, I would like to read the essay on silence that you oh, just sure. mentioned. Can where can I find it? Thank you. All right, very easy. You just uh, message me on Telegram. I ask it because very easy. Once your Telegram is there, I just need to uh, copy and paste the file. Very easy. Then you get it. All right. I don't have to. You know, I don't use email very much nowadays. Right. So it's uh, easier. It saves me a lot of time with Telegram. Then I can go back to my work. See, one thing I'm very happy when this sutta comes to an end is I can get back to finishing my essay. Now I'm studying this uh, uh, Burmese religion, you know, Buddhism in Myanmar. The development is very interesting from the sociological and uh, political point of view from the Dharma side, it is. All right. Okay. Next question. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you. Glad to be here. Next question from Maya Opal. Yeah. He said, uh, he can relate this to Samana Pala Sutta, okay. where Jivaka is shown as King Ajata Satu's physician, and yeah. he suggests that the king go and seek counsel right. from the Buddha. Yeah, very true, very good. Now you notice you have Jivaka there, and he's already a doctor, is he? he's already at Ajata Satu's side. I think these two stories are very far apart in time, you know. The, the Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta is when perhaps Jivaka was still a baby, right? At the early years of the Buddha's ministry. And then Samanya Pala is when near the end of the Buddha's life. Wow, you know, you see Jivaka now is a famous doctor. Uh, but at the beginning of the Samanya Pala Sutta, uh, D2, 
two, right, B number two, you also see the nature of silence mentioned there, right? Jivaka was silent all the time. He doesn't say anything. You know? Because the, the, the king says, uh, who shall, uh, it, this beautiful moonlit night, uh, who shall we visit? Huh? Shall we visit this teacher, that teacher, all the six teachers, uh, the various ministers, they follow different teachers. So each suggested their teacher, but Jivaka remained silent. And Jivaka is the Buddha's doctor. Then the king, Ajata Satu, asked Jivaka, why are you silent? You know? Who do you suggest? Then uh, Jivaka says, there is the Buddha. <laughs> and then the, before the, Jivaka can say anything, the, the king is like waiting for this moment. He says, okay, let's go. <laughs> you know? Let's go at that very night. They, they, he went with all his elephants and, and wives. The, imagine the, the, the long retinue, you know, go to see the Buddha. So the Buddha had a busy night <laughs> teaching the Dharma to him. And I, the, the Dharma probably went on through the whole night. As you can imagine in the background, the soldiers are falling asleep and so on. And here you see Jivaka listening. And, uh, you know, we may study the Samanya Parasutta. I don't know, we see how eh, in, in later, later on. So yes, there, there are very close connections there. I'm very happy you noticed that. All right, next question. Uh, uh, thank you, Brother Pia. Uh, there's no more question in the chat box. Uh, mm. Any brothers and sisters who would like to uh, ask yeah. your question verbally, you may do so now. Thank Five you. more minutes, okay. If you have any question, just uh, raise your hand or turn on your mic and ask. You notice there are other teachings connected with this Abhayaraja Kumara Sutta. You have the nature of the double horn question, the dilemma. <clears throat> so the introduction is not very long. So read up, you find there are lots of extra information there. And then the nature of right speech, why the Buddha doesn't use the other kinds of uh, uh, approach in language is because they are against right speech, right? So they're either false speech or unpleasant speech, you know, that's rough speech, uh, useless talk, and so on. Eh? So the Buddha doesn't use them. Okay. So you find, uh, in, for example, the famous parable of the burning house, although it's very very beautiful parable in the literary sense, is the ending is based on a lie. Okay? The, the, the story, the parable says that the, the father did not, the, the father told the children, hey, I got all these beautiful cards for you, you know? But then in the end, the father did not have those cards. So the, the story is telling us, oh, it's okay to lie because you're saving the lives of the children, you know. Well, so this is a very clever way, you know, of checking uh, readers. While it may be true, but then again, these are exceptions. So once you make the exceptions to the rule, you're going to get problems. You see? Of course, if someone's life is in danger, you, you may say such things, but you got to limit the truth to that. So we cannot be saying, oh, it's okay to lie anytime you want because you are teaching the Dharma. We can't say that. So that is just wrong, right? So that's where you have problems. That is why the Buddha doesn't follow that kind of line. You, you cannot generalize one exceptional situation and say, therefore, it applies to all situations, right? It's not like that, right? Okay, a few more minutes, any? Last minute questions? Photograph, Anna? Yes, yes. Uh, everybody, mm. please turn on your mic. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So make sure you, your face is up a bit, no? not too low. And it's really nice to see you all, and this is the time. Yeah, you can so unmask yourself. <laughs> All right. It's really good. You know, now the unmasking shows that COVID is slowly going away, but don't take it for granted. Yankui, Cindy, are you there? 
Yeah, maybe you can take one question first. Oh, sure. Question? Yeah. Question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Question from Brother LCO. All right. My Sutta knowledge is limited. Can I ask, is there any Sutta reflecting Buddha to be flexible in speech, in light hearted manner to make his teaching more interesting? Mm, I suppose there are. Let, let me look and then I will send to you. Okay. And uh, if you don't receive it within a week, just message me and see. I have yet to write a paper on uh, Buddhist humor or the Buddha's humor. There, there is a title slotted from one of the coming, a few more volumes, I think. There, there'll be one on Buddhist humor. You know, I, I dread writing essays, but I know when the time comes, I'll just lose myself in it. I don't think about it, just write it. I mean, it's just like this volume 16. And volume 16 celebrates 20 years of our Sutta work. It has grown into three volumes now. You know, I don't know, it might become four volumes. And the, type, the, the theme of this SD60 is Buddhist experience. You know how much you can write about that. So I'm writing a lot of things. In fact, in, in these three volumes, I am using all the training I've had in, in philosophy, sociology, psychology to put together the way Buddhists behave today in, in society, in, in Myanmar, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I try to explain, for example, why there is religious violence. Right? That is part of Buddhist experience. You find nowadays a lot of monks are becoming very violent. They say, hate the Tamils, hate the Muslims. Uh, that is shocking, right? Why, why do they say that? You know, Even in Thailand, you have all this hatred towards each other, monks against monks, you know. So why does this happen? And then later on, I'm going to study the nature of meditation and, and the difficulties people get, breakdowns and problems, you know, how to deal with them, how to prevent them, how to correct them. There's so much study and materials by specialists nowadays. So what I'm doing is I'm summarizing all this so that you know where to look at all these wonderful, important readings so that we know what we are doing, and we also keep ourselves safe studying Buddhism, and we, we keep people safe so people don't get hurt by religion, definitely not by Buddhism. Okay? But the Buddha's teaching has got some very important and wonderful things for us to know, but there, there are so many things distracting us today, and we have to be really focused and calm and go straight to the Dharma. Right? That's called Uju Patipana. You go straight to the Dharma, Uju means straight, yeah? one of the meanings. Yeah? So that's what that's why I'm uh, I'm really enjoying writing all these all these things. Yeah? Just to share with you this volume 60.1a. Now I'm writing 1b and the, the psychological issues about meditation will be in 1c. Okay? Now I'm reaching the end of 1b. I'm taking a bit of extra time, supposed to be out last month, but because now every week I exercise three times, so that takes a lot of time. So I'm slowing down with my work a bit, but health is very important also. Okay, so no more last minute questions, eh? Uh, there's one more question, yeah. oh, okay. okay, who? Um, Sister Patricia. Okay, okay, we have two questions. All right, go on, please. A friend of mine is looking for information about how to develop self or love. Can love you recommend a book? Loving self love, is it? Uh, develop self love. Oh, self love. Meta, in other words. Eh? Yeah, uh, she uh, is looking how to be more kind to herself because she has a lot of uh, negativity in her mind and she. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I, I please uh, message me. I think message me directly on Telegram is best because right now we're busy for a while. Uh, just tell me the keywords, what ideas you need. Then I will look up so that I can send the right sutta or a few, few uh, items to you, few titles to you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, any more? Brother Maya. Uh, Maya. Just okay. Please. Yes. And Okay, Mayan. Okay, you able to hear me? Yes, yes. 
Oh, okay. Uh, maybe if I may add uh, regarding that uh, light-hearted uh, Buddha speech. Okay. So, okay. I just want to share this that I read a sutta. It's called uh, Dhaniya Sutta, Dhaniya the Cattle Man, in which Buddha engages in. Uh, I might not call it banter, but it's like very, very uh, light-hearted role play with a cattle man. And it's like here there's a Buddha, and here there's okay. a cattle man who is talking yeah. about his cattle and wife and children, and it's about to rain. And it's okay. kind of almost like a poem stanza by stanza, like one stanza. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Daniya Sutta. Daniya Sutta. Daniya Sutta, yeah. And they're talking yeah. about, you know, if you want rain, God, go ahead. Yeah, and... yeah. So yeah. I, mean, I just want to share that, that if somebody oh. wants to read it, it, it the uh, because when I read this Sutta, it was yeah. raining actually that evening. And it put me in such a good mood that, you know, it's very lighthearted and the way Buddha is interacting with well, it. Very true. Well, I'm happy you see it that way because... All this, you know, I envy you because you, you are from India and, and the Buddha is from there. And that event of Daniya Sutta is beside the river Mahi. And the Mahi River is huge, you know. It's amazing, this river. That's one thing about rivers in India. They don't like Singapore rivers. It's more like a strip. <laughs> there, you have this Mahi River, really huge, you know. And, and uh, the, the, the river goes high and low in volume depending on the rains so you you have this this like a dialogue you know here you have this rich man dania is a cattle rich cattle man and he's thinking about his wealth and his happiness his children and the cows and here's the buddha like through youtube you know i mean like, i mean on, on, on internet <laughs> he, he's not there he's far away another place the buddha sends oh. his image or, or somehow he communicates mentally with dania and Daniya hears, Daniya and the wife, we're not told whether the wife hears the Buddha's voice or not. So you have, Daniya gives a poem, I think probably in shloka, like Dhammapada, and then the Buddha replies with another verse. So Daniya presents the worldly version, say, oh, you know, I have so many cows, and the cows are male, I'm very happy. And Buddha says, I have no cows, and I'm very happy. <laughs> you know, so it's very really beautiful, you know. The Buddha says that, use the same words, he just said the opposite. He said, I'm oh, happy okay. too, you know. And so at the end, Daniya is thinking, oh dear, so what's the point of me having all these things, you know. In fact, the, the Buddha saved the life of Daniya. After that, there was going to be a flood. The flood was going to wash the whole place, and his family moved away, and, and, and they, became, they, they were saved because of, you know, listening to the Buddha also. So that is the Danya Sutta. I think we studied that in one of our uh, lessons. So do look up that Sutta again. Right, that's wonderful. Any any last urgent Sutta uh, question? No more, huh? No okay. more, okay. no more. Very good. Right, so now it's time to close. I'm very happy you all have been patient with, with me and listening to the Sutta. Let us spend this quiet moment now, okay? Send your wonderful kind thoughts to Ratna so that she recovers quickly. And uh, it's a, we have gathered here to dedicate two hours of our life to the Buddha Dharma Sangha, reciting the precepts, paying homage to the Buddha, five precepts, practicing meditation, listening to the Buddha's teaching. Remember these wonderful moments. By all these good actions you have done, may we be well and happy. If the time comes for us to face the weakness of our bodies, may we too be strong and recover quickly. May those we love and care for to be well and happy. Send your thoughts to them. <clears throat> for me personally, I wish each of you, wish, wish you well and happy. Your minds calm and clear. The Dharma bring you happiness and share that happiness with others. That's the only way you can be more uh, truly happy when others are happy too. Reflecting in that way, let us bow to the three jewels which are so precious to us. Arahang Samasam Buddha Bhagava, Buddhang Bhagavantang Abhiwa Demi. Bow down to the Buddha. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami. Bow down to the Dhamma. Supatipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namami. Bow down to the Noble Sangha. 
Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.